Phase 1 SDR payments begin with over 66% increase. 4 million ringgit in grants to boost prevention in industrial accident. Malaysia Madani, I'm Daryl Baptist and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. We begin tonight's bulletin with news from Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim who today expressed hope that the significant increase in the Sumbangan Tunai Rahma or SDR payments this year will be able to alleviate the burden of the people. Datuk Sri Anwar, who is also Finance Minister, said the maximum SDR payment for the household category has increased by over 66% to 500 ringgit from only 300 ringgit last year. The Prime Minister posted on Facebook that he acknowledged that the hardship caused by the rise in the prices of goods is a major problem, inflicting a large portion of the population. He wrote that the Madani government is committed to ensuring a dignified life for the people, adding key the national stability lies in fairness and social justice. Payments for Phase 1 SDR to 8.2 million recipients begun today. The Malaysian Fire and Rescue Department will focus on more than 400 hotspots across the country following the dry season that is expected to begin next month. According to its Director General Dato Noor Hisham Mohammad, the focus would be on peatland areas, illegal waste disposal sites and landfills owned and operated by local authorities. Lokasi yang paling kita risau ialah uh, kebakaran gambut. Lah. Jadi uh, kawasan gambut utama yang kita tahu di Selangor, Pahang, Johor, Sabah dan Sarawak ini uh, kita akan uh, beri tumpuan uh, kepada lokasi-lokasi yang telah kita kena pasti. Met today, he said the dry weather this year is expected to be worse than the previous three years. Therefore, he'd asked the public to alert the department immediately if they had any information about the irresponsible party that started the fire. Kita buat pemantauan uh, melalui sistem juga. Tetapi yang paling penting, orang cakap yang paling efektif sebenarnya pengesanan ialah mata uh, manusia itulah. Maksudnya dia boleh lihat, dia boleh beri maklumat dengan tepat, lokasi, uh, keadaan kebakaran untuk membolehkan kita bertindak dengan lebih baik. A syndicate charging up to 2,500 ringgit to smuggle foreigners into Sabah has been crippled by the State Immigration Department with the arrest of four locals here in Penampang over the weekend. The four suspects, two men and two women aged 25 to 56, were arrested in two separate operations. The authorities also arrested a total of 11 Filipinos, believed to have been brought into Sabah by the syndicate. Sabah Immigration Director Dato Siti Saleha Habib Yusof said nine of the foreigners were found in a four-wheel drive or 4WD that was bringing them to Kota Kinabalu from Sandakan. Parti yang ditahan daripada lapan orang lelaki berasal daripada Filipina dan seramai tiga orang perempuan uh, juga berasal dari Filipina kesemuanya seramai sebelas orang okay, kesemua yang ditahan ini berumur antara 8 bulan hingga 47 tahun yang terdiri pada lima orang lelaki tiga perempuan dan tiga kanak-kanak Briefing reporters today, she said the immigration team also identified a house in the Penampang area that was being used as a transit house for the undocumented migrants before they were ferried to other locations. She said the syndicate provided services to bring in foreigners, especially Filipinos, at a cost of 1,500 to 2,500 ringgit per person. All the foreigners have been placed at the Kota Kinabalu Immigration Detention Depot for investigation and follow-up action. 
The newly appointed head of state of Sarawak, Tun Dr. Wan Junaidi Tuanku Jafar, was today sworn in as the 8th Yangdi Patua Negri at the State Legislative Assembly Building in Kuching. Tun Wan Junaidi and his wife, Toh Puan Fauzia Mohamed Sanusi, were received on arrival at the venue by Sarawak Premier Tan Sri Abang Johari, Tun Openg and his wife, Puan Sri Juma Ani, Tun Tuanku Bujang, as well as State Assembly Speaker, Dato Ama Mohammad Asfia Awang Nasa. Upon inspecting a main guard of honour mounted by officers and men of the Royal Malaysian Police PDRM, Tun Wan Junaidi proceeded to the Dewan Lapau for the swearing-in ceremony at 4pm. He took his oath of office and signed the Surat Sumpah, or Letter of Oath, witnessed by the Chief Judge of Sabah and Sarawak, Tan Sri Abdul Rahman Sabli. He then signed the letter of declaration as the Yang Dipatua Negri witnessed by the Sarawak Premier. Tun Wan Junaidi, who will celebrate his 78th birthday on 1st February, received the instrument of appointment from Yang Dipatua Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riyal Yatuddin Al Mustafa Bilal Shah at Istana Negara last Friday. His appointment, made in accordance with the Article 1 of the Sarawak State Constitution, is for a four year term from 26 January 20. 2024 to 26 January 2028, replacing Tun Abdul Taib Mahmud, who held the post for three terms beginning 1st March 2014. Coming up next, 2.6 billion ringgit channeled to help entrepreneurs last year. Bursa Malaysia maintained its upward trajectory to end higher for the sixth straight trading day. The Bursa Malaysia KLCI gained 9.11 points to end at 1,515.39 from Friday's close of 1,506.28. Decliners led advances 513 to 499 on the broader market, while 471 counters were unchanged 805 untraded and 64 others suspended. Turnover meanwhile decreased marginally to 4.32 billion units, valued at 2.98 billion ringgit from Friday's 4.92 billion units worth 3.42 billion ringgit. The Social Security Organization, also known as SOXO, distributed grants worth 4 million ringgit to 37 non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, and institutions to boost initiatives for industrial accident prevention. Deputy Human Resources Minister Datuk Sri Abdul Rahman Mohammad said the allocation was disbursed to enable NGOs and institutions to conduct 423 activities, including competency training, media promotions, seminars and strengthening awareness of occupational safety and health. Among the recipients were University Malaysia Pahang Al-Sultan Abdullah and the Malaysia Institute of Road Safety Research. Kita nak supaya mereka ini terlibat dengan uh, membantu kita uh, bagaimanakah kita nak menyelesaikan masalah masalah yang sering berkait dengan uh, kemalangan di tempat kerja, kemalangan waktu perjalanan uh, ke tempat kerja. 
Datuk Seri Abdul Rahman said this after the launch of Soxo's 2024 financial aid grant in Putrajaya today. He also said specific prevention activities and measures need to be planned considering that the number of accidents recorded by Soxo last year was very high, totaling 82,876 cases. He added enforcement aspects need to be given serious attention by authorities to reduce workplace or commuting accidents. Amana Iktia Malaysia, or AIM, has channeled a total of 2.6 billion ringgit in funds to entrepreneurs last year. The funding is a government initiative aimed at helping entrepreneurs improve their living standards and eradicate poverty. Memanglah, eh, di Malaysia kita ada banyak peluang, peluang perniagaan, peluang untuk usahawan capai eh, kejayaan. Jadi uh, saya sangat bangga dengan apa yang telah dijayakan oleh Amanah Itia uh, dan ini uh, adalah satu yang kami harap uh, yang amat berhormat Perdana Menteri juga akan memberikan lebih banyak uh, sokongan dan uh, dorongan untuk menaikkan Amanah Itia menggunakan konsep Amanah Itia ini. He said this after a working visit to the AIM headquarters today. Meanwhile, AIM Managing Director Mohammad Shamir Abdul Aziz said that AIM is targeting the participation of 340,000 AIM registered Sahabat Usahawan or micro entrepreneurs this year, with a total allocation of 2.61 billion ringgit. During the visit, Dato Ramanan also participated in the Madani gathering with AIM Indian entrepreneurs held at the AIM headquarters compound. Foreign investors returned as net buyers on Bursa Malaysia, contributing to a net foreign inflow of 267.7 million ringgit. MIDF Research said it was a shortened trading week in conjunction with the Taipusam holiday on Thursday, and they only net sold 66.6 .6 million ringgit on Tuesday, but were net buyers for the rest of the week. MIDF Research said the top three sectors with the highest net profit inflows were financial services, utilities and property, while the top three sectors with the highest net foreign outflows were consumer products and services, industrial products and services and healthcare. MIDF Research noted that local institutions turned net sellers for the week after disposing of 167.1 million ringgit worth of equities and only net bought 21 million ringgit on Tuesday, but were net sellers for the rest of the week. Local retailers, meanwhile, net sold 100.6 million ringgit last week. This is their fourth consecutive week of net selling. MIDF Research also said Bank Negara Malaysia kept its overnight policy rate unchanged in its first Monetary Policy Committee meeting of 2024 at 3% as expected. The research house expects the central bank to remain status quo on its monetary policy stance throughout this year to ensure a sustainable growth momentum for Malaysia's economy. Malaysia's Producer Price Index, or PPI, which measures the prices of goods at the factory gate, recorded a decrease to negative 1.3% in December last year, as compared to negative 1.5% the previous month. Chief Statistician Dato Sri Dr. Mohammad Uzi Mahidin said the downtrend was attributed to the mining sector which fell to negative 3.4% due to the decline of both extraction of natural gas and extraction of crude petroleum indices. He said the manufacturing sector continued to shrink to negative 1.5% as against negative 1.4% a month before owing to the manufacture of coke and refined petroleum products and manufacture of food products indices. The electricity and gas supply sector also went down to negative 0.6%, similar to the previous month. Conversely, the agriculture, forestry and fishing sector increased by 1.3% after a decrease 
increase of negative 0.4% in November 2023 due to the incline in animal production and fishing in the seas. Meanwhile, the chief statistician concluded that last year, the PPI local production went down to negative 1.9% after a growth of 7.8% in 2022. This was the first decrease since 2020 due to the lower prices of Malaysia's main commodities. Commodity prices last year were perceived as highly uncertain due to price volatility, especially in energy markets. Research houses are positive on the utilities sector after the Ministry of Energy Transition and Public Utilities announced a slew of renewable energy or RE initiatives and programs last week. MIDF Research said the latest announcement by the ministry underpinned a strong visibility of the RE pipeline for the power sector this year. As such, MIDF Research has maintained its positive stance on the power utility sector, premised on a firm energy transition policy layout which should drive improved growth and environmental, social and corporate governance, or ESG, profile for the sector. It believes RE Engineering, Procurement and Construction and Commissioning or EPCC players such as Sunview, Pakat and SolarVest are among the immediate term beneficiaries given a potential rise in demand for RE EPCC services. Meanwhile, Hongleong Investment Bank Berhad maintained its overweight call on the utility sector based on strong structural themes as well as a positive earnings growth cycle. Overall, it views the cumulative 2.8 gigawatts of new RE quotas through various programs as a significant boost for the sector, as this sets in motion the government's 70% RE share by 2050 target as outlined in the National Energy Transition Roadmap. The Malaysian palm oil remains sustainable and its zero tariff rate would be beneficial. The Trade and Agriculture Commission, also known as TAC, an expert advisory group to the United Kingdom government, concluded the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil, or MPSOs, require member of CPTPP. In a statement today, Malaysia Palm Oil Council, or MPOC, Chief Executive Officer Belvinda Sron said the new independent expert report clearly showed that Malaysia's commitment to sustainability is clear and that the MSPO certification scheme is the gold standard for sustainable palm oil certification. MPOC noted that it is clear from the detailed expert report that all domestic and international companies supplying the UK market can now have full confidence in MSPO as a genuine verification tool for the UK market. MPOC also said that in addition to support from experts, Malaysian palm oil has also received political support at the highest levels of the UK government. Maybank Investment Bank or Maybank IB maintained a neutral rating on the automotive sector and a cautious outlook for the industry this year. It anticipated the total industry volume to stabilize at 650,000 units this year, a 19% decrease year on year after two consecutive record years of growth. Maybank IB said the two key themes to watch for this year are the increasing trend of agency model adoption and the acceleration of electric vehicle transition as the country has emerged as an increasingly attractive destination for foreign direct investments from global automakers establishing their regional headquarters or EV hubs. It also said car makers such as Mercedes-Benz, BMW and Audi have announced local assembly plans for vehicles targeting both domestic and export markets. The influx of foreign direct investments is expected to have a positive long-term impact on the industry contingent on the position of auto players in the supply chain. However, for local players in the production and distribution chain, Maybank IB anticipates intensified competition this year, potentially impacting their margins. The consideration takes into account numerous new product launches, including scheduled EV brands or models throughout the year. 
Proton Commerce Sundarian Berhad, the financing arm of Proton, is eyeing an even higher number of loan disbursements this year as it strives to be the number one financier of the national car maker's vehicles. Last year, Proton Commerce extended a total of 27,288 loans to Proton buyers, hitting a new high in the number of disbursements since its establishment two decades ago. Proton said eight out of 12 months in 2023 witnessed more than 2,000 disbursements, with March reaching an all-time high of 2,934 due to the rush to deliver bookings made during the National Economic Recovery Plan Incentive period. The carmaker said the firm's annual market share in Proton financing has demonstrated a steady upward trajectory progressively advancing from 9% in 2018 to an impressive 18% by the end of last year. Through a collaboration between Proton IDA and CIMB Bank, Proton Commerce provides financing solutions for Proton buyers and its performance mirrors the upward trajectory of Proton sales over the past five years. Proton Commerce demonstrated resilience, staging a recovery to set a new record in disbursements in 2022. And this echoed throughout 2023 with a growth rate of 21%. Malaysia Aviation Group Berhad, or MAG, is set to expand its fleet by introducing 12 new aircraft in 2024. This includes its first Airbus 330 or A330neo, which is scheduled to arrive in the third quarter of this year. The group said it was looking to receive four A330neo this year, alongside eight Boeing 737-8 to support its network growth requirements. MAG signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Airbus, Rolls-Royce and Avalon in August 2022 for the acquisition of 20 A330neo scheduled to be delivered through to 2028. The A330neo would provide improved operational efficiency to its fleet while also allowing it to address environmental targets by offering up to 25% reduction in fuel consumption and emissions. MAG Group Managing Director Dato Captain Izam Ismail said the induction of the first A330neo in third quarter would gradually replace the A330 CEO fleet and operate to the network across Asia, Oceania and West Asia. Asia. Additionally, the group would retrofit six of its A350 900s beginning 2026 to ensure consistent cabin standardization and premium experiences for guests in line with the new A330 Neo cabin, further solidifying its fleet modernization initiative. Still ahead, Skydiver dies after base jumping failed. Welcome back. A 33-year-old British base jumper has died in Pattaya, Thailand after his parachute failed to open. The man has been identified in media reports as Nathy Odinson, a skydiver and base jumper who shared photos and videos of his stunts to a Facebook page with 10,000 followers. The incident occurred when Odinson jumped from a 29-storey building in the town's beach resort area at about 7.30 p.m. on Saturday night. Police and paramedics arrived at the scene shortly after the incident occurred, but the victim was declared dead at the scene. Odinson had gained access to the roof of the building with some friends who were filming the stunt for social media. His brother, Ed Harrison, explained that footage showed Odinson's mini pilot parachute was caught in his harness making it impossible for it to be deployed. 
Base jumping is considered to be considerably more dangerous than skydiving. Unlike with the long drop from a plane, those taking part have just a few seconds to react in case something goes wrong. Jumpers typically rely on a single parachute rather than having backup parachutes like those typically used in skydiving. A Hong Kong court today ordered the liquidation of property giant China Evergrande Group, a move likely to send ripples through China's crumbling financial markets. The decision to liquidate the world's most indebted developer with more than $300 billion of total liabilities was made by Hong Kong Justice Linda Chan who noted Evergrande had been unable to offer a concrete restructuring plan despite months of delays. It is expected a provisional liquidator will be appointed to oversee Evergrande ahead of a permanent appointment. Evergrande, which has $240 billion of assets, sent a struggling property sector into a tailspin when it defaulted on its debt in 2021. The liquidation ruling will likely further jolt an already fragile Chinese capital and property markets. Coming up in sports, Messi and Inter Miami gear up for friendlies. Stay with us. Lionel Messi, along with Luis Suarez and his Inter-Miami teammates, trained on Sunday on eve of their Riyadh Season Cup encounter against Al-Hilal. Inter-Miami take on Al-Hilal at the Kingdom Arena on Monday. One of two matches the MLS side will play in the Friendly Cup competition in Saudi Arabia as part of the club's first ever international tour. The soccer icon and Inter Miami have a two-game tour of Saudi Arabia this week. The first match on Monday against Al-Hilal. The second match coming Thursday is against Al Nasser, one where Messi may share the pitch again with longtime rival and fellow great Cristiano Ronaldo, assuming the Portugal star has recovered enough from a calf injury to play. The club has already played two exhibitions this year, one in El Salvador, one at Dallas Cotton Bowl, and has matches in Hong Kong and Japan still to come after the Saudi swing is complete. It's basically an around the world, big crowd, big money, bright spotlight batch of pre-season games for Inter Miami, which instantly became a global brand when Messi announced last summer that he was joining the Major League Soccer Club. Australia beat Indonesia 4-0 in the first game of the Asian Cup knockout stage on Sunday to advance to the quarter-finals after a gruelling match at the Jasim bin Hamad Stadium in Qatar. Indonesia had not beaten Australia in 43 years and despite the Southeast Asian side's loud supporters vastly outnumbering the Australian fans, it was Graham Arnold's side who prevailed when they converted their chances. Australia took the lead in the 12th minute when Jackson Irvine's cross was deflected into the net by defender Elkan Baggett. Martin Boyle gave them a two-goal cushion on the stroke of half-time when he connected with Gethin Jones's cross to head in at the far post. Craig Goodwin came on as a late substitute and the forward made an instant impact when he pounced on a rebound to score in the 89th minute. Towering defender Harry Suter, meanwhile, made it 4-0 moments later with a glancing header from a set piece. The Socceroos are trying to win the title for a second time and were again solid rather than spectacular in getting the job done in the last 16 encounter. Australia will play either Saudi Arabia or South Korea in the quarterfinals. That's it from us this evening in our top story, Phase 1 STR payments begin with over 66% increase. My name is Daryl Baptist from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thanks for watching.